people here already use my turn which is great i know folks like from west philly use tool librarian you've got some options Jean's just here to kind of talk about um, a little bit about what my turn does like what its capabilities are and to answer questions for those that are using it or might be interested in using it or maybe you use a different software and just want to know a little bit more about what makes my turn so different so Jean, thank you and take it away Thank you all for being here again. Um, it's great to meet with so many of you, especially people that I've talked to mainly online. Um, it's been great. Quick question, how many of you are using my turn already? Probably. <laughs> how many of you have questions or wish you could actually use it better? I, so I'm going to go through a quick little introduction about uh, my turn and the team, where we came from. Can you a yeah. So I'm going to do a quick introduction um, on myself and my turn. I'm going to go through some of the types of lending libraries that are already using the platform. It did start with tool libraries, and I'll get into that. Um, then I mean, we're going to go through some of the basics. Um, if the basic, pretty much everyone is good with the basics, I'll skip pretty quickly into a couple of advanced topics, things that. Um, some of you may be using, most of you are not, but just so one, you know it's available in the software, and two, um, I'm trying to focus on things that might help really optimize the operations of your library, a little bit on sustaining the library, um, getting more members, serving those members better, um, allowing them to pay you more easily, um, things like that to really try to get your library going. And then I'm going to try to leave most of the time actually for Q&A because I know just in the conversations I've been having with everyone there are many questions um, and many ways that you know, you're not sure how to maybe do something and I want to try to get through a bunch of those questions here and then we'll also have some time tomorrow morning we're supposed to have any sort of unofficial my turn users group during breakfast. Uh, so if you're here I'll be there. What I'm hoping is it's kind of more there'll be more of a discussion tomorrow. Um, between actually people who are using it or people who might be interested in using it. I can either be fly on the wall or answer questions, but I'd love to hear, you know, candid feedback. And I'll kind of start with that with, um, with my turn or anything else. We'd love feedback. We'd love to know, you know, how you're using the system, if you're having problems. Uh, so, and even if there are questions while I'm presenting, I'm much more comfortable with sort of a conversational presentation rather than just me trying to give you a whole bunch of information, so feel free to ask questions while I do. So my turn, first of all, is not just me. Um, I have a team of people. It actually started, Nancy up in the upper right was did the original coding on most of it. Um, I, I can code. I'm not a day-to-day -day developer. Um, and the way we got started, as Micah mentioned earlier, was I helped found the West Seattle Tool Library. That went from an idea that um, one of a member, I was on the board of a nonprofit up in Seattle. One of our members brought the idea of a tool lending library to us in West Seattle about um, October or November of 2009. Um, we ended up opening the West Seattle Tool Library and doing our first loan. I just looked it up with a post hole digger on <laughs> June 12th. Uh, 2010, so about eight or nine months later, and that first that first loan was in the original version of Local Tools, which became my turn. Um, I got involved in the project one because I thought it was a great idea. It was you know, reuse, um, redu reduction of waste, and increasing access to tools and other goods. People in the community, um, one people either couldn't afford them or people who just didn't want to have all so much stuff anymore. I was like that. I had just moved out to the West Coast and the East Coast. I, in, in just a few years uh, living where I was living before, I realized how much stuff I had accumulated. It was insane. Um, it was, but it was great to unload it. But I still wanted access to all those tools, and that was sort of why I helped start the tool library. My background was in tech. I've been running a consulting company for over a dozen years at that point. And so I kind of got roped into, oh, we need a, you know, inventory system for the tool library. We looked at open source library systems. We looked at 
rental systems. Um, the library system, traditional book library systems really just didn't handle tools and lending and the types of things that um, we do at tool libraries. Rental software mostly was install it locally, clunky, expensive, cost thousands of dollars. And I figured, you know, with my background, um, I have a team of folks, including Nancy and Miranda, um, we started to you know, just put something simple together um, to get the inventory in. Um, as you know, running a tool library or any type of lending library is a little more than just having a database online with the inventory. So that snowballed into inventory. Then we needed a way, oh, we need to track the members that are you know, either pre-signing up or signing up. But then we need to track those loans. We need the reports. Um, turned into you know, a pretty huge system um, even pretty quickly. So, I, you know, but again, we got that that initial version that, um, as Piper mentioned, like you know, get something out there that I was embarrassed about. I was embarrassed about you know what local tools was probably for about the first two or three years that it was out there. Just um, my background being in tech and working on really nice, solid um, enterprise type software. It was just kind of almost painful to use, and I just, you know, there's so much potential. And you knew, I, you know, I still have a vision of where we want the software to be to make sharing of any type of item for any organization um, or any community really easy. And that's that's where we're going. Um, we still have a long way to go, but especially over the last year, I think we've come much further. And in that last year, or actually the last couple, couple of years, we now have kitchen lending libraries up on the platform. Assistive devices, so toy libraries, some of which are just, <laughs> we don't have pets yet. <laughs> <laughs> Assistive devices and toy libraries, uh, bike lending libraries and bike lending programs. Um, there are a couple around, including one on UN um, University of North Carolina campus. <laughs> Energy efficiency lending libraries up in Seattle. There's a smart building center. They actually lend out um, any if you're doing an energy efficiency retrofit or building, doing a building, um, you can borrow light meters, infrared sensors, just about anything else. So we're actually they actually lend for free. They're a nonprofit, and we were talking with a couple of utility companies that are doing the same thing in California to get them up on the platform to really use the idea of sharing and lending to help with energy efficiency and really di very directly help on things like climate change, um, not just through reduction in consumption. Um, AV equipment um, on campuses as well as um, Lansing Public Media in Michigan, they lend out um, they're basically their public TV station allows you to borrow a essentially backpack studio to go and record. So if you want to do video recording at a professional level, and of course we do have a couple of tool libraries. I think a uh, <laughs> few in the room and another uh, 80 or 90. Um, and we actually have these lending libraries now on the platform all around the U.S. in Canada in the UK, Belgium, Netherlands, New Zealand, um, pretty much not quite worldwide. I don't think we, we've talked to a few places in Asia, none there yet, but hopefully Ooh. soon. Awesome. Um, and you'll, I'll demo a little bit later that currently the public side of the MyTurn platform can be translated into other languages. We have a few of the folks who've helped with that in the room for the French translation used up in Canada. Um, and it, especially anyone who's in areas where there are multiple languages spoken, you can um, translate the platform into other languages to reach a broader audience. So in addition to what I said, we have that uh, portal studio, ice cream makers, beer bottle caps, <laughs> for, uh, the baby carriers that have been mentioned once or twice. Uh, this is a New Zealand, has two different lending libraries for homemade um, musical instruments cool. and sporting goods, fitness bands, fashion and clothing, certain, um, raspberry pies. So really just about anything you can imagine, you can now borrow. It's great to see there's a 
there's a library of things up on the platform um, in the UK, in Chrome. Uh, Toronto's going to be opening their library of things soon as well, which is great to see. And can't wait for that. And basically, you can manage any type of lending library up on the platform. And you really want everything to be able to be shared. So, and I'm pretty amazed day to day that you know we basically go from baby carriers to robots up on the platform. I think there are even a couple of drones. So super low tech, super high tech um, tools, everything in between. So we really want to make this a. Uh, you know, cities being very shareable and all communities being shareable. So there are some tool library, lending library software um, options out there. There's a, I might be a little biased, but my favorite is my turn. <laughs> uh, tool librarian is also a great option to check out, especially if you are straight tool, tool library straight tool library as opposed to other types of lending library. Um, we have a couple of users in the room. I know at West Philly and a few other locations, um, we are happy to have competition. We think it's great for people to have choice. There's Lend Items, which is another cloud-based um, system that's very, very basic. We know of a few lending libraries that use it. It's when I say very basic, it is very basic, but it's, it can be a little simpler to use. So if you're not charging membership fees, if you're, if you're completely free, you have a small number of items, it's not a bad option. Um, there's a lot There's a lot of other ILSs, integrated library systems. There's rental software. Most of them are really not geared towards lending libraries specifically, they are geared either towards rental or towards if it's library systems are more towards books and media as opposed to other types of items. Um, but there are a good number. Um, you could rent you could write your own, which I, I don't necessarily recommend <laughs> having gone through it um, and never being done. And there, there's a lot of other useful software out there. I will put it in a little fact sheet. Um, some of the things that I'll gather from you guys and love to hear about what other things you're using to supplement your lending library software. Um, whether that's for managing classes, I know there's a lot of interest in managing volunteers and not a lot of great solutions out there. Um, I can't tell you when because I don't know, but we are looking at um, adding class management software to the MyTurn platform. It'll like, we, we've recently added, beefed up our reservation support, uh, which some libraries are using, not a whole lot, where basically members can go online, not just see what you have, but they could actually also set up a reservation. I need to work on a project two weekends from now. I need these three or four items to submit a reservation. Uh, we're going to be adding a calendar view to that, and once we add that calendar view, it's another just a couple of steps to then also, oh, I want to register for a class. And I know that integrating these systems is going to be pretty important because you know, public libraries have this issue where they have one system for their books, they have another system for ebooks, they might have a third system for audiobooks or different types of ebooks, and it gets to be a little bit of a nightmare. So we're trying, we're trying to approach that in two ways. One, add some of the features that maybe don't exist elsewhere. Uh, and then my turn will also be integrating with other platforms. So um, we'll be offering later this year single sign-on um, with other platforms. So that way if you are using something different or managing another part of your library or classes or services you offer, that's where we're at. So I'm going to jump into a little bit of a demo. And so show some of the people who maybe haven't seen my turn, some of the features, as well as then um, show off a few of the features that maybe some of the libraries here are using, but many may not be, and some you know, recommendations on what you should use. Pretty cool. They are. They are. 
Absolutely. They are an awesome <laughs> library run by a great team, amazing volunteers. I, I really recommend visiting them. Next <laughs> Yeah. So with my turn, when with my turn site, when you visit the site, you basically um, browse through photos of tools or other items that are on the platform. Um, you can see which items are currently in stock, um, other items when they're due back. You can browse by categories that, um, you, that basically the library can set up. You can add and edit the existing. There were, we used to provide some default categories. We actually don't do that anymore. You can basically set up whatever categories you want. Um, you can also browse by type of item. And the way that's split, typically the types are what an item physically is. And I'll show a little bit about that later. And categories, we often recommend using them as how they're used. Or you know, we've seen other creative uses, like organizations that are offering clothing. They'll put you know, sizes in or something that we didn't have before. And, you know, recently, we just added um, size and color to the clothing category. So you can basically either do a search. So let's say I'm looking for a table saw. Gene, could you speak up a little? OK, yeah, okay. sorry. Thank you. So I'm going to do a little search for a table saw. Um, you can see that Station North has, uh, has a good number of table saws. And if you happen to want that one, it's not due back until 3.4. But there are a number of in stock, so you could head on down to uh, borrow a table saw. If you click on an item, you can get more information about that item. And there are a number of fields that you can fill out on each item, um, including description, manufacturer, model. And I'll show adding a new item in a little bit. So basically, inventory, you can search and browse. Um, Station North does, does let you log in, so if you have an account, log in and um, use some information about your account, including your account history. Matthew. I have a first question about the, this is the public aspect of yep. the library? Yes. You're not logged in yet? Yeah, this I is have a good. question about this. Uh, is this possible for uh, people to know the new schools that we've added to the library? Not yet, but we will be adding a sort by, right now we have relevance and then just alphabetical. We're going to be at, adding a, uh, way to basically sort by newest tools available. And what does relevance mean in this context? When you're, when you're doing a search, it'll actually basically pick, uh, use an algorithm to pick what's what's closest to your search, even if it's not like an exact name match. So exact name matches will show up first, then it might be um, something with a similar name, et cetera. So relevance is just kind of like your Google search where you just type in some keywords and it's trying to pick the best match. And if you have issues with the search and you're like, oh, why isn't it showing something showing up, let us know. We do refine the search algorithm, especially for relevance, pretty often. And so we're always trying to tweak it and make it better. We got some feedback, I think, from Northeast Seattle. Um, they wanted some changes to how results come back and that happens. So you know, if there's something you're like, why isn't something showing up, definitely let us know. Okay, the database behind and uh, how does it work with, uh, you know, uh, those uh, fancy stuff we have in French, uh, accent, and, uh, <laughs> and, and Typically, there is a two ways. One, you can search uh, multilingual. So you can, you can or should be able to do a search with those fancy characters and accent marks. Those should work. And um, or if you search for like the non-accented version, it should actually use that as uh, should match in both ways. If you're not seeing that. But let me know offline, but we've done some work to make sure that the searching with um, non-English characters, sh it should be working. Uh, just to piggyback off that, is there a way to uh, have set the default view, like right now what we're looking at, as like the um, most checked out or highest demand items? Not yet. Okay. So it basically, what I'm going to ask you to do is if you have my turn features that you want to see, pop them up on a sticky, one of the sticky or a number of stickies. Um, I'm going to guess that most of the things you're asking for are on our development list. Uh, 
I think last week, with our last release, we were just um, finishing up items in our development list, includes bugs and new features. I think it was up to about 3,600 since we started. So, wow. it's, yeah, it's, it's just a huge platform and has been getting bigger over time. Um, so again, some of those are, you know, a number of those are bug fixes, but our development roadmap stretches out uh, easily over the next two or three years. Wow. And we plan to be around that long and a lot longer. So <laughs> my, my previous business, I ran for about 20 years and still have a foot in that. And I expect my turn to be around even longer. So you're also, it's like, well, is this platform going to be around in a few years? Who's managing it? Um, we are incorporated. We are for, for profit, but public benefit corp. So legally, we're a B corp. So we have basically a dual mission of you know, both sort of the traditional corporate profit mission, but also an equal mission to both social and environmental uh, benefits. And that's one of the reasons why we are such big supporters of tool libraries and sharing, especially at the community level. It's like really important at the community level, um, and that we also scale up to businesses, cities, municipalities, and regional partnerships. So, but I'm gonna, I'll jump back in. Um, one of the newer features that we have is the ability to embed your public MyTurn site onto your own website. So we have a couple of organizations doing that. Here I just again picked a uh, random tool library and embedded it on the MyTurn site. We have some instructions up on um, support.myturn.com for uh, especially doing it in WordPress. I think WordPress is probably the most common content management system for main sites here. How many people are using WordPress? How many people are not? <laughs> so I think it's pretty much the whole room. <laughs> we, we, we're, we're focusing on basically that supporting WordPress first, we'll add some support for Google. Um, the way we're doing it is right now just simply with an iframe, so even if you're not using WordPress or another content management system, you still can embed basically the public portions of the site um, onto any website. So there are, there are I'll, I will qualify that with if you're using WordPress.com, a free site, they don't use, I don't think they allow you to use iframes. Um, you have to use a plugin that they support. So even if we develop a plugin, we might not be able to get it onto those WordPress.com free sites. But if you either have a self hosted site or you're hosting with um, any one of the hosting, any one of the hosting services, you can then add, there are a couple of plugins that we recommend allow you basically embed. Um, sometime in the, I don't know how near future, we will probably also be adding a direct WordPress, WordPress plugin to give even more seamless access and be opening up some APIs, which we've been promising for a while, but we keep getting sort of higher priority items out there. But that is in the plan is to open up APIs, so if you want to do more direct integration, if you have someone on your team, is a developer. Um, we're headed in that direction. And if you, if you have someone now, you're like, we wish we could do X, and we wish we could integrate, talk to me sometime while we're here or send us an email. Um, we're starting a sort of developer's list, so that way as we release a beta of that, we'll let you guys know. I am going to jump to the here. Self-registration of users, yeah, where they can go yeah, and pay by credit card information and all that. Yeah, they, and do you allow them to buy purchase their membership up front, online or not yet? Yeah, like they can come in and buy it and put in their credit card information right there. And that's been working out pretty well. Yeah. Great. Just sure. speak a little bit louder. Okay, sorry. Yeah, just let me know if I'm not speaking <laughs> loud enough. I do have a tendency to speak a little softly. So. Basically, um, we have a few libraries using this, and we have other customers. Um, and I strongly recommend doing this, is you can set up, um, allow people to both sign up for an account online, so before they come into the library, so their information is filled out. You can also allow them to pay for membership 
what, as part of that sign-up process. You'll need to connect your um, or you'll need to connect your site to Stripe, which is our online payment system we're using. Set a few other options, um, which I can run through, or we have some help. And then you can basically allow people to sign up online, pay by credit card, and there's a renewal process as well. So that way they'll get in. And it's not it's not automatic yet. We're going to have an option for doing automatic renewal, which will also allow for monthly automatic. So if you want to offer monthly memberships, which some libraries do, and in that case, if you don't want to be either forcing someone to reprocess their card by hand or having to have them pay every month, you'll be able to do recurring payments. Any idea when that will be coming out? Later this year. <laughs> we're we're going to be working on it next. We got a couple of it. It was, it, we were hoping for next month. It'll probably be a little bit after that. We got a couple of items tossed higher on the priority list. Uh, question uh, about uh, the signups. Can you restrict the kinds of membership that they can purchase when they're signing up? Yep. Like I will actually show you that right now. So I'm just going through the normal sign-up process right now. So basically, the nor normally on the sign-up process, they just be taken to my, their their account, which doesn't have a whole lot of information yet. This, I just basically clicked on create account, filled in the, some basic information, and we really upfront try to just get the minimum amount of information to allow people to create an account so they get in the system. Um, it then brings you to a page where any of the memberships that you offer, that you select for purchase online, will show up on this page. You can have one, you can have three, you can have a whole grid of nine. You can basically even offer a sliding scale. Um, so people, you can have a rec basically a recommended fee, or as I think Piper was mentioning, a dollar per thousand dollars of yearly income. Um, and so people can pay what they want, or they can, you know, maybe they're an organization, they want an organizational membership, they can select the organizational membership, um, or just a regular, I'm going to go for the um, regular membership here. I also know recently on the tool library mailing list, um, the issue of tax came up. You can set up taxes in my turn to track, calculate, and charge tax. Um, and you can, um, you'll see on the nonprofit organization, typically 501c3s in the US are tax exempt, so they don't have to pay. You can actually pick which um, memberships they'll charge tax for. Um, you can then do a purchase. Member enters their credit card. Pays, and now they have basically signed up, paid for their membership. They haven't had to come into the library yet. And their account's created. Um, membership expiration isn't until next year. And one other thing that that will do, and I'll show you this on the administrative side, is so right now we don't have um, online agreements and forms. And in the past, most of the school libraries, they really wanted someone to come in and physically sign a piece of paper. I'm guessing that's how most of you do it. How many of you would like electronic forms for agreements? How many of you just don't want it or wouldn't use it? So it, it looks like it's actually more than about half actually would like to use online, you know, basically sign, you know, electronically sign and agree to policies. We will be adding that also later this year. Um, that'll, be that'll definitely be coming within the next month or two. And so that way, basically, members will be able to sign up online, pay, fill out their agreements, etc. cetera. Um, we also have an option in there that will put a user warning in if they've signed up online. So the first time they go to check out, you'll see if you have a little red warning at the top of the checkout page saying, this person signed up online, you know, please check their ID or check their bills <coughs> and confirm who they are. So that way you still can have that double check and make sure it's not just some random person they come in and say who they are. Um, I, I take it it should be straightforward enough just to, I mean, I. I Similarly, prefer people to physically sign something, but is it possible to 
you send out a copy of what they signed, or you know, the, the rules, or you know, just so they they have. Occasionally, people ask for that, and um, basically forget to be militant. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. Um, our plan is going to be, once they've signed the agreement, to email them a copy. Sort of like, um, as folks who use my term already know, you can have receipts sent out when they check something out, when they check it back in. This way it'll be, here's a copy of your agreement. There will also be versioning on the agreements, so that way if you change your agreement, then any, next time that person signs in, or they come into the library again, there'll be a warning that they haven't agreed to the new term. What about um, each member thing having like a photo of that member or a picture of their ID? So photo of the member, we're going to be expanding the profiles. Don't have that on as a timeline, so either you or they would be able to provide a photo. Um, and we can talk. Do you want it to be so that just the library and an admin can change that? So you set the photo so that someone can't just go into their online account and change it? Um, let, let us know if that's definitely a concern. Photo of the ID, we probably will not do. Um, basically because then it's storage of very personal information. Like to give you an idea on the credit cards, we're not storing credit cards. It's all being done by Stripe. Um, you know, our, our platform is very secure. Um, well, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but every access to the platform is via um, HTTPS, or H basically secure connections all the time, admin, users, etc. Having said that, at this point, we don't necessarily want to store like, a photo of you know, driver's licenses, passports, things like that in the system. So I'd actually say there is a there is an option to say, you know, have, we have, right now there's an option for a credit card on file. Um, I'd say something similar or just make it part of your process that you check the ID and maybe just take a, you know, will allow the ability to add a photo to that profile that the admin set. So someone can't impersonate someone else. If you take a photo of your ID and put it in as their photo, we don't recommend it, but, you know, it, 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 you know, as I said, site secure, but not meant for all that type of person. Aren't the oh, membership, oh. the type of, sorry, the type of membership, yeah. the three that we were just looking at, can you have one posted that it explains what it is, but you can't actually purchase it online? You have to come in and say, hello, I want to actually talk to a person about mm -hmm. this. Yeah. Not currently, but that's a great idea. And added mm -hmm. to the sort of, we'd like to see that, uh, see that feature. Um, so most of the organizations will have that on their main website, but having it with the other memberships, that's actually a great idea. So that way, you know, it's like we do have these other memberships, whether it's sliding scale or organizational. So, awesome. Um, I'm one of those people who's not interested in having people sign up online. Um, but what I would be, what I do like, and it's something we offer on our own website, is we just have our, our sign-in sheet so that if they wanted to download it at home and print it out, they could bring it in, but I want to see their face. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, and, that, and that's why we have in, in the past offered the um, doing the forms, because most, most early on, most of the tool libraries, especially that we talked with, they wanted signed paper copies that they store in a safe, um, along with typically information about the ID or a copy of the ID. We are hearing more and more of that, but it's more people. Um, does Stripe support Canadian currency as well? Yeah. Canadian, UK, um, I think they're up to like 100. And, well, I think in, within, including their beta, at least about um, 40 or 50 countries. So, and Canada, UK, we use it all the time as well. We currently have it set up so people have to come in and sign paperwork, but I'm wondering what is the benefit to giving to give people access to my turn? Apart, we don't turn the reservations on, so you can't, can't res reserve. What's the other, and it's not recurrent payments, because that would be great, but what are the benefits of opening that up? So if you allow people to sign up, one, they can actually see um, the information about them online. On, they, you know, let's say they move, they can update their own um, address, things like that. And they can see any, if they if they if you're using reservations, they can see their upcoming reservations. They can see a full history of all their transactions. What have they borrowed in the past? 
Uh, when did they pay for membership? How much did they pay for membership? Um, reprint any of those transaction receipts. Um, so let's, you know, it's like, oh, you know, they lost the email, but they want to basically see what, what do I have checked out? Um, they can basically see everything that, uh, that they currently have out, late fees that they have. So they can manage their account there. We have some plans for user profiles in the future, um, including things like leaving comments and reviews on um, tools or tool types and tips. So that, that's something that we've been planning early on. It just hasn't popped to the top of the stack, is basically making it a little bit more of you know, some social network type features added in. And I think at that point, it'll be able to there'll be even more for you know, the members to go and do online. And we're very open to ideas on you know, how, do, how do you make your library and the platform more of a community. So, uh, speaking of the, the registration process, we, and regarding the photo ID, we just take the number from the photo ID, whether it's the driver's license, passports, or whatever, whatever people want to use. We're taking that number and currently put it in a field that I think says address notes or something like that. Yep. Is there a way for us to make an actual ID number field, or would that be yeah. something we need to request? Uh, so, I believe there are ID So, I'll, I'll jump into the uh, My Turn dashboard, which many of you have seen. So, you know, sort of quick overview of your library. We'll be making, we hope to make some changes when we roll out the new look. We'll be making some changes here to do things like members right now is all your members total ever. We're going to have active members and then as well as expired members right here on the dashboard. Um, that's coming pretty soon and we'll have some, you know, better and more stats. If there are specific stats that you want to see um, right on the dashboard, let us know. Um, and same thing with additional reports. There are specific reports. Send us feedback. You can either you know, send it in by email. On the support site, you can open a ticket. Um, open a ticket, say we'd love to see a report for X. If it's something that we're gonna, that's going to be useful to everyone, great. Um, if there's something that you really want that's really specific to your library and it's not necessarily going to be generally useful, um, we have had um, all sorts of organizations sponsor features or some customizations. So we do do that if you can somehow come up with some of the money to actually pay for it. Um, but otherwise, it'll, and what that usually does is sort of bump thing, bumps things up on the priority list. Um, but having said that, you know, the things that are just immediately obvious, especially things like adding new reports, pretty easy. Um, let us know what you're looking for. We'll either let you know, hey, you can actually accomplish that already with one of these reports, or sounds great, um, we'll try to get it in in the next period of time. Uh, but let me go to add a new member. So, I believe you were asking about. Okay. We did it as a uh, custom field for one of our other uh, customers. That's what I was thinking of. So, we do have a you know, official ID field. And, and, and anyone else want that official ID field? Enabled for like all for tool libraries, or are you guys not trying to? Okay, if you want that enabled, let us know. We can, we can so you can use that for membership numbers, right? We have it already. Yeah. Well, we, oh, we have membership ID. Yeah. We yeah. still use it because, well, so our problem with membership ID yeah. is that we want to know how many members we have when we have multiple locations. Right. And so I can't, I don't want to have separate numbers, so there's, five, there's four people that have number 62. I don't want four number 62, I want one number 62, and then the next one 63, 64, 65. So, uh, like, we have to use a different Google spreadsheet manually every time we enter somebody in, and then put it into there. So, you have two options. If you're, a, like, there are only a few lending libraries with multiple locations. Um, for the IDs, that's the one way to do that is we, we actually chatted briefly, and I thought about this. Yeah. yeah, so about a year ago, we added the ability to have multiple locations. Mm -hmm. And so you can set up multiple locations with their own inventory, but you have combined reporting, combined um, user database, um, 
IDs picked from the same pool of user databases, and you can basically set up an arbitrary number of locations and even sub-locations. So that's why that exists now? That does exist now. What? It's, a, it's an add-on feature. It's used, we're usually only enabling it for larger organizations, but we're starting to push it down into smaller ones. So we can chat about that. Okay, so, uh, sorry, quick question about that. So if a tool is checked in, for example, at, if we were to use one my turn, which yes. is so ideal, and then uh, if we checked in, it would be like, oh, this is in Puckdale, this is in Danforth. And you'd be able to search across all the locations, or just search one specific location. Yeah, I'd send you guys an email about that when we released it, and I didn't get a response, so. <laughs> 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 uh, I haven't sent that to you. Yeah. Oh, trust me, I know. <laughs> carrier lending libraries, we have a hundred of them coming on. They actually wanted to have separate my turn sites rather than just using the sort of combined location. We're adding some reporting and another layer of administrator above that. We're not doing unique um, member IDs across them yet, but that's actually a really good idea. They haven't asked for it, but I think it might that would actually make sense as another layer there. Um, so basically what it is, you've got Toronto with four different, you basically have four separate my turn sites. So you'd be able to have an admin that can log into any of them, roll up some reports, see what, run some reports on what are, what's your inventory at each location, uh, who are the members. Uh, with the baby carrier groups, they want to be able to know is there a recall on something, who do we need to contact, so they need that sort of centralized reporting as well. Um, that's probably the way you'll want to go at this point because you have the four locations. And then you don't lose any of the features. So you don't get like the customized. Um, does everyone know you can customize the emails that go out to your members? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are you know, there can, you can change the templates. You can't change those templates location by location right now. If you have sort of one combined location, so that would be the one downside. Well, that's okay. But last, last follow up on the good on follow up on locations. Um, was it? Yeah, is there a way of um, making certain items not uh, accessible to the public, but actually keeping it in the inventory? So this would be for retired items, what we need told after just for statistical reasons, but do not want the public to see its status. Yep. So on the left, there is uh, in there basically there's a settings area. Under inventory settings, there are statuses. Um, so you can basically set statuses for items, and items can have multiple statuses. I can't hear you. Sorry, you can set a, you can set one or more statuses on each inventory item. So each if your tool library, each tool, and if any of them don't allow checkout then those items cannot be checked out. You can also set a visibility, so that way are they only visible to administrative users, or are they visible to members, or are they visible to the general public? So you have multiple ways to control the visibility of items. Um, some organizations, I think Station North, um, even has ones like waiting for parts. Uh, but they still want people to see that those items, they have them, so they're visible, but you can't check them out because they're in like the maintenance type status. But you can, yeah, so this way you can make it invisible. Right? Yes. Yep. Um, to do with, this is two questions. One is the privacy of information. Um, we want volunteers to be able to type in everybody's personal information, but we don't necessarily want them uh, constantly being able to access that information all the time, right? So they, they need access to it if somebody changes the information or if it's a new member. But other than that, I don't think they really need to know that personal information. Yeah, there, there a couple, we've gone back and forth there, and we've started to add different levels of permission. Um, is anyone here using sort of the um, lower level permission where someone can only act, they have volunteers or staff that can only access or add the inventory or just do loans and members? So that's a relatively, relatively newer feature, and we're going to be adding even more um, access levels. Now, 
So one of them is if you basically edit the user and go to privileges. So what most of you are used to using are super users, which can edit all the settings on the whole My Turn site. You can actually do what's called a location administrator. If you have locations enabled, if not, it's just going to say a main location here. You can give a, say, a volunteer or a staff member just the ability to add an edit inventory and not see the member data at all. Um, you can also give them just loaning the uh, loan space with the permission. That lets them check items in and out. It does, however, let them also see the member. Because one of the, one of the issues we've come up with is that sort of balance of, OK, if you're checking the item out to the member, and they mention, oh, I changed both my address. You still want that the person who's in the staff member. You usually want them to be able to see that information and fix their address or other personal information. If someone has better thoughts on sort of, you know, maybe only if you're checking an item out and not allow the report, I, I think where we'll probably go is those um, admins will probably not be able to do sort of full export. So that we'll be able to search, see like first name, last name, username, uh, but not be able to just export everyone in full so they can't like just steal the whole membership and right. like, you know, do a mass mailing. We haven't had a problem with it, but it's just a yeah. And one of the questions is inventory. Inventory automatically goes to the next number. Yes. And over the years, people have decided to put an extra number. So now we have an extra thousand tools or you know, that we didn't want. I doubt that. Um, so there's like seven digits and when you add a new tool. And I don't want a seven digit tool, I want a three or four digit tool, you know? Um, and can I can we reset that somehow and make it a default to the lowest available number above X? We we, we have talked about that and pop it on the list. So and basically, <laughs> and start basically start to fill in some of the blanks. Yeah. One one reason not to, um, we're gonna and one thing we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be allowing the membership IDs to use a different range as the inventory IDs, and we're going to do that by default. Um, the main reason there is for the organizations that are using ID cards or library cards, to be able to scan it on the barcode scan, it, which I was going to demo, but probably wouldn't have time. And if basically your numbers don't overlap, it'll, the system will be able to tell, oh, you know, 1237, boom, that's a user, 1234, um, you know, 4449 is an I tool so it'll you know, do the right thing. Since we have this historical sort of overlap, we'll do it based on um, you know, what's most appropriate for that page or ask the user. Or any, and I'll ask this question, anyone here using barcode scanners with my turn at this point? Do you know that you can? Oh, great. Come on back there. Do you know that you can use barcode scanners? Yeah. We started to, but decided against it just because it was a little bit cumbersome. Uh, and not as logistically functional with scanned stickers falling off the tools. Yeah. Especially with tools we don't usually push it hard. Um, yeah. You can get pre-printed metallic labels um, mm -hmm. that do stick really well. And however, they are pricey. Um, they're usually like 60 cents to a dollar per label. So if you have two or three thousand tools, you're yeah, there are there are both discounts, uh, but it is it is an investment. Um, if you're averaging more than a couple of tools per loan when someone checks out, it can certainly help. Um, we do have some organizations like um, the Energy Efficiency Library. They will lend out 200 items at a time, so they absolutely need barcodes, barcode scanning. There's a neat feature where. If you're basically scanned, like if someone sets up a reservation and they want 25 items, it'll, and they just grab, and they have 200 of those on the shelf, you can grab any 25, scan the 25, and swap those out for the reservation um, for the other items. So the barcodes can save time, but if you have a short number, going back to uh, <laughs> Toronto's question about those seven digit numbers, if it's like two or three numbers, it can be faster to tap it in. It is a little more error prone. So from my understanding right now, only super admin people, super administrative people can actually catalog tools. Will there be a different, is that correct still? No, the, you can send people to be inventory only and then they can catalog tools and that's it. They can't see users, they can't check items in or out. So you can 
actually have someone who is just doing your inventory. Um, I didn't so, even know that was, it wasn't, when did that come on? That came on last summer. We, and no. Also, oh, no. <laughs> I haven't checked since then. <laughs> we, 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 I, I fully admit, we sort of get a little heads down in adding new features and a little not so great about communicating them to our existing customers. And they are often mentioned in, you know, we do about a quarterly mailing. They are in there, but you know that those get missed. We're going to be doing uh, basically weekly to every couple of week blog posts with you know tips and tricks, and we're also going to be doing some video recordings on you know what are the tips, for, certainly for the basics and for certain questions like that. Because we do know our education has been of our customers, including as we add features, has been a little spotty to say the least. So. So that. Next question. It's just like a one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> um, so I, a few times, um, I don't know what the reason is, but the site has gone down, and you know, we're there, and we're trying to check out tools, and we have to do it manually and do it later, I guess. Um, I'm wondering if you consider doing an offline version that at least temporarily can then upload automatically to the back online. Is this, is this a possibility? Let's say you get hit by a truck outside. Like what's going to happen? So, to, we're, we're addressing that in three different ways. Um, right now, we're in the process of a migration over to Amazon Web Services, where we will be fully scalable, fully redundant. Um, one system goes down, another one spins up to take its place. Um, having said that, there are also issues of you know, networking go down. Um, over the last, uh, this past week, we actually moved all the images are now in Amazon S3, so they'll serve faster. Um, some of you have reported issues with your, you know, you'll take a photo on a smartphone and it's upside down or sideways. That's all been fixed. All of your existing images that were like that, they are now all um, rotated properly and will be rotated properly moving forward. Um, so that was a big cross. Yeah, going, going back to reliability. So one, we're going to be adding additional redundancy that should address certainly the issues, especially when we're doing updates. We try to do updates. Right now, updates require about a minute of downtime. And that's most of the downtime. We have run into some issues here and there. Those are usually done at about midnight Eastern time or later. Um, and we tend to wait until there's no one on the system. And that's getting to be never anymore. Um, with New Zealand, UK, etc. So that's we're going to be going to basically zero downtime updates within the next couple of weeks. Offline is a challenge because then it's resyncing, especially if you have multiple locations or maybe one person is online. Um, we do have some that's kind of been on our roadmap. It's probably not going to happen soon, but we definitely want to do that. Um, mobile apps will probably come first, and we'll be doing the store locally on a mobile app. So if you have smartphone, tablet, etc., probably towards the end of the year, and saying that for a while, but this year I think is do or die on um, mobile apps, those will definitely have, okay, you know, use your mobile app, you can scan, and then we'll resync when you can reach it. So because we have a little more control, it's a little easier there than doing the offline. We can do it, it's just we're trying to, you know, hit as many birds with one stone. Okay, yeah. Mike, you had a question. I was going to say, for, for us, the downtime is usually on our end, not your end. Right. And that sort of added to me would be a, a feature for us. To... Yeah, so no, we, we do realize it's an issue because, again, it's not even we're down, it's some of the network somewhere between you and where we are. Um, you have you know, a network out if you're a cable motor provider, just randomly down. Yeah. So no, we, we realize it's an issue. We haven't gotten too many complaints and too many. So I don't know how many of you really run into it that often. But honestly, if you're in the middle, you have a line of people out the door. The last thing you want is to have to start writing things down by hand and then do data entry later. It is a pain. Yeah, we, we do understand. We, I, I've been there. So I do feel free. Question back. Yeah, I, I think uh, I fairly heard that you said you fixed the audience, the photo orientation uh, issue. Correct. Is this a, on more of an auto orient? Or uh, can we go into the inventory and reorient pictures that are saved? Uh, we reprocess every image of the system already. So if you check your site, oh, shit. all done. <laughs> so I have another question about photos. It seems like the resolution quality, like let's say from an iPad, 
seems like way lower than, than the camera's capable of. Is that a MyTrip problem or a problem? So to give you an idea on the photos, we store the full resolution version of what you upload. Then we tend to reprocess um, down to thumbnail size and then sort of that larger size if you click on the image on the item page. Um, we've increased the quality when we just reprocess. So basically, and we've also done some optimization, sort of lossless optimization, which we even do on JPEGs these days. So the quality should be better. If you want it even better still, send, send us a note. We can turn that up and turn up some of the sizes. We, we try to find basically a good balance between um, size of photos, how quick they're, quickly they're going to load. I think we, we definitely did turn image quality up when we reprocessed them. So check your old ones. If the original photos you uploaded were higher quality, they're now higher quality on your site, all done already. You don't have to touch them again. And we can reprocess. We're probably going to be doing another reprocessing of all the photos at some point in the future. So you know, we're constantly tweaking, tweaking how that's done. You made my Saturday night. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Are you just asking questions about both sides going nuts? About what? Both sides going nuts. Both sides. I have a question about the dashboard, the analytics, and the graphs. Okay. Um, is there a way to set up a range for the dashboard for all that? Coming. 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 Yeah, no. We, we wanted to have that with the look and feel update. Um, on the, like on the charts and graphs, basically, we're going to have you know, last, you know, last week, last month, um, and then also have full reports. Um, one of the th I'll talk a little bit since, yeah, I'm running out of time or out of time. Um, some of the things that we have upcoming. So reports, right now, all the reports are based on a specific item, which we know are not the most useful. Um, we're going to be doing it based on item type. So if you want to see basically what are your most, um, uh, go away. <laughs> Microsoft. Um, what are your most popular item types? We're also going to be adding the ability to allow you to add custom item types. So if you do have 10 or 15 of a certain item, you'll be able to set that up as an item type and then just add four, five, six. You'll be able to have you know unique item codes. You'll still be able to override them, but you'll be able to expand the tool or the item hierarchy. Right? The first version will just be leaves. Um, because again, one of the reasons we try to Keep that hierarchy consistent. Actually, two reasons. One, so every organization doesn't have to come up with how are they going to categorize types of tools and allow for browsing. Two, um, with tool libraries in the same area. One of the things we really want to push, and I'm going to talk with some of you um, both tomorrow and as we're talking, is cross library search. So find items at your nearest library. So if there are multiple libraries in a geographic area, or if you're looking for, you know, maybe something, you know. Toronto's doing library of things. You guys have kitchen libraries, you have tool libraries, all the library of things. People will tend to be just looking for something. Um, we'll be doing even custom portals on like a city or a region basis. So you can look for, I was, you know, I need a tent and a power saw. So usually you're not gonna be looking for them at the same time. <laughs> but you might, you'll see you'll be able to set up one place to go and then you'll know, wanna talk with you guys about how we can promote that in communities. So that way, people can, their first option can be to borrow or rent rather than to go and purchase something new. So I think we have just like a couple minutes, maybe for some more questions, but I also want to remind everybody that we have a My Turn Users Forum scheduled for tomorrow morning during breakfast. Maybe like a little bit more informal, but you can kind of get in depth. If you want to help Jean kind of prepare for that, if someone wants to volunteer to put a sticky on the wall and maybe start writing down some of the other topics you want to have covered in the forum over breakfast, that would be probably really helpful for Jean. So I'll leave Jean to kind of wrap things up for the next couple of minutes and then we'll have our lunch session. Well, one thing I wanted to mention, just uh, it's another thing we added recently, and thank you to uh, Montreal who helped sponsor this, but language support. So you can basically um, enable different languages on your site. When you enable other languages, um, they will show up up top for your members, even when they're not logged in, um, or remember their selection. And basically, you can have Spanish, French, German, English, Dutch. Um, some of the translations are a little more complete than others. So the ones where you see a couple hundred items, those are pretty good, so English and French. Um, the other ones, you, if you would like to contribute a translation, you can actually turn translation mode on 
on this page. And this is in settings organization language. You can then wander around your site. Um, let's say you don't want your members to be members anymore. You want to be patrons. Your members are now known as patrons and patrons. And you just instantly translated English to English on your site. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm not going to try to do French or my Spanish might be able to do it. Um, th basically, we are at, there are a couple of glitches when you're doing this, but if you look at like the listings, you can translate um, <coughs> just about all the text on the public facing version, so what your members will be seeing, and we're slowly, more slowly than I'd like, enabling translation of the administrative interface as well. So that way, if you have volunteers that you know, say are French speaking, yes. <laughs> Does it affect the word in the email we send with my friends when you change it on the website? It the it'll affect it should affect when these words are used in the email, but it doesn't have, if it doesn't let us know. I have I don't know if I I don't know if we tested that, like it but it should. It should actually use the translated words. If not, it's bug and file it. Um, right now, one of the places where you don't have the ability to translate is um, like the messages that go out to people, the receipts, the transaction, you know, sort of the transaction receipts and things like that. We will be adding that so you'll be able to have each one in a separate language. Right now, if you have a, you know, most, most of the library is in multiple languages, it's usually two languages, so we recommend put the French version in and in the, and the English version of what you want to say into the customized email templates. Um, but we will be enabling you to have language translations for each one of the emails. And can you refresh me? Can we assign the language to a user? So we always communicate in this language with this user? Not yet. So well, the user can pick their language, but it's I don't know if it's actually. When they come to the website. Yeah. 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 That's that's actually a great suggestion. Hop it on the board. Uh, this is really interesting a feature uh, we will uh, use it. Yeah. <laughs> that is good. And the uh, the words that we put in is it only for our site or is it shared? Right now it's only for your site, but you can export it and then share it with other sites. And if you send, if you basically make it more complete, um, we're gonna enable you to share it. What we're thinking about doing is actually setting up a central site where you can actually go in, log in, do the translation. So if you in Ottawa and a couple of other, or some other um, libraries in Quebec want to do work on your own French translation, go in together, work on the translation, and then ex export it, we can then make it the default. So we'd love the systems for that. Um, if anyone wants, has the bandwidth to do a Spanish translation, I think that would be huge, especially in the US, um, but also we always get in, we get interest from South and Central America. So, and right now there are only a few languages enabled for translation, I think about seven, we can enable a whole lot more. Um, if you have others. I know in West Seattle, I think there are like eight different languages spoken just in West Seattle. When I was up there, and I, you know, my probably speaks this for a large immigrant population. So we, we, we don't have some of the languages that are spoken in West Seattle, primary languages up there, but we can add them. It's basically add them to the list. Um, we've just been adding them as we've gotten requests. So. Uh, I just want to put a shout out to you and your team. Yeah. 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 One thing that's been the most surprising to me is I'll send an email to Gene, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm, maybe I'm sending it at like 11 or midnight, and just thinking in advance for the next day, and then bing, it comes in, and I'm like, whoa, I guess I got to do this now. <laughs> so it's almost like, uh, instantaneous at times, and uh, you know, just the thoughtfulness and yeah. the uh, the nature that this program is really kind of a game changer to everything that we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you. Very true. Yes, thank you.
Yeah, Gene, G E N E, at myturn.com. You can contact me directly, hopefully not everyone at the same time. But honestly, <laughs> I, I, I tell this story, it's getting to be less and less true, but um, I end up doing a lot of the support because I want to know what our customers are saying about the product rather than handing it off to some, you know, someone else. Because I do a lot of the product, sort of the product management and defining how things are going to work. So I'm the one, if something works in kind of a weird way, I'm a good person to yell at. Um, it, up until about six months ago, I really, there'd be weeks where I'm like, is anyone using the product? <laughs> yeah, and then I'd go and I'd see, it's like. Then you change the interface and everybody. Yeah. <laughs> what the? Heck? I have no idea how afraid I was. <laughs> yeah, the dashboard changed and we were like, what, where is everyone? Oh my God. <laughs> and then you realize, oh, the menu is going from the top to the side. Yeah, yeah. Oh, better now. <laughs> yeah. we, 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 we got one complaint from one library about, you basically, you moved my cheese. I said, Every, they're like, you got rid of features. I'm like, no, everything's there. And then a day later, they sent an email back. It's like, oh, this is so much nicer. It's <laughs> but but I, I, we were freaked out. We, we, we've gone through two overhauls on the user interface. Yeah. This one by far the biggest. And it's oh, it, you know, it's nerve wracking. We're sending this thing live. What are people going to think? But we, you know, pretty much all the feedback has been, it's been great. But just to go back to that last little story, and then I'll let everyone get some food. So I'll go weeks. It's, it's like a week or two. It's like I haven't gotten it. Like no one's asking about. You know, we we get like requests for you know you, people want to sign up, but no one has a problem. I go check. Wait, who's that? You know, Northeast Seattle just did 600 loans last week. Or, and rebuilding together did a thousand of them you know, in a week over the summer. Um, so, and it's like it's just all this activity. So we don't get that many support requests. Um, but again, just to reiterate what I said earlier, if there are things you, you know, you're finding yourself doing things that are repetitive. That you, there's an easier way to do it. If you can't do something in my turn, we want to hear about it. It doesn't mean we'll always be able to, you know, fix it right away or get to it right away. We'll usually at least acknowledge that we got the message and. As I said, I can show you our bug tracking system that, you know, with like close to 4,000 items in it between bugs and features. Um, so it's probably in there, but when you let us know what you need, it helps elevate the price. So that's true. Of all my and, and thank you all. You guys have also been great. I, as I mentioned this yesterday, but just seeing all the wonderful work that the libraries are doing. I and mean, this, this is why we put the platform out there. We wanted to make it, you know, remove one of those big pain points for starting school library, a kitchen library, a lending library. We want this worldwide. We love that it's already, you know, into Europe. It's, it's, you know, we want to get into more non-English countries where, you know, it's need to be less. Um, you know, great stories. You know, there's Bro Pittsburgh helping people grow food. There's a um, food bank that is lending tools, has a community garden, so they lend tools to help people that basically um, don't have enough food to help grow their own food. Uh, so it's like these stories just kind of, it, make, it makes me happy to you know, work on this project every day. Um, and we do have we, have, we do have full-time staff. Uh, Nancy and I are pretty much full-time on this. We're around about half-time and a few other folks that jump in. So there's a lot, there's a lot of work going on on this. This isn't like a side project. This is our main thing. So we want, we want to hear about it. Your feedback is helpful. That's it. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Steve. So uh, we're ready for lunch. Maybe, you know, I'm sure everybody's really hungry, but it'll be there for the entire session. So if you're not, like, starving, losing your mind, maybe let, like, the line not get too crazy. Um, because we're just going to keep rolling, and we're going to get the next panel set up, and they're just going to start. So, you know, be a little conscientious, like, totally want to have conversations.